that's basically all science can really tell us because quantum mechanics has a similar probabilistic basis so really all that you can say is that anything can happen at any moment but it probably won't this is basically like you have a box of gas uh, how do I make this this work um, and it's like a box of gas and some of the gas molecules have like arranged themselves in the corner into like a beautiful elaborate story explaining how gas molecules in a box of gas would never arrange themselves into anything other than just disparate clouds. <laughs> That's basically what's going on there. Yeah, and people are still <laughs> arguing that... Well, you've got Luigi Fantapier who argued, and uh, there's a talk I gave on reverse time effects which you can watch at another time. Um, I'll put a link in. Reverse time causality and other reverse time effects. And Luigi Fantapier, this Italian mathematician, argued that that was the laws of entropy are governing the non-living parts of the universe, so all the dead matter is kind of running down and winding down and losing structure. There are parts of the universe, at least on the Earth, that we know about, and quite possibly elsewhere, which are going the other direction, getting more complicated and reorganizing themselves, or organizing themselves into these. Um, we have a shrieking bird outside. But, uh, yeah, on the Earth, life forms such as the one you just heard shrieking, you know, complex, self-organising, self-reproducing uh, uh, organisms um, don't seem to be following the laws of thermodynamics in an obvious way. Now, the thermodynamists would say, oh, that doesn't really matter, this, this is just a little back eddy. You know, the general tendency is the river flowing one direction, of course you're going to get little localised pockets going the other way. That's not, you know, that doesn't counteract our argument that entropy is basically increasing and all of it's eventually going to end up down that way. Um, but Fancy Tapier was more imaginative uh, and said, no, life is being caused from the future. There are two sets of, there's two types of causality going on. There's a sort of forward driven causality driving the non living matter, but living matter is subject to something called syntropy, which is pulling it from the future. And, um, you know, you meant, I'd never heard of him until quite That's recently. Crazy. Yeah, t life is being caused by the future. All of the non-living stuff withers away into soup and then the, like, living the living stuff, and then becomes like the age of the living stuff. It, and, and it fills up the entire been, universe. Like, the age of non-living stuff. Wow. Most of the universe is non-living stuff, yeah. apparently. Well, and there's like a tiny little wow. bit of living stuff. This just ties in with, um, <laughs> there's a reality report episode where Eric and I debate his idea that humans have a duty to convert all the non-living matter in the universe. He's a serious <laughs> young man who knows a lot about artificial intelligence and the ethics surrounding it and computer theory and all sorts of things. Towering intellect um, compared to mine. But his, his personal orientation with the universe is that living matter is better and you know it, it, it's a terrible shame that there's all these dead planets and asteroids and if we could send our nanoprobes and synthetic life generating technologies eventually you know harnessing the power of artificial intelligence rather than I being a robot. I think living stuff's really nice. I know and I was trying to argue it's with him. It's good to have a bit of both. Well, yeah well he, he just he, he he wouldn't have it and I, w I was trying to argue I mean you can watch this episode but I was trying to argue that what if you know you're going around spreading your idea of what life is you know mm. creating something what about if there's already sentient like yeah. clouds of gas that you're going to sort of disassemble and you know yeah. basically destroy to build your idea of what and he, he took that on and he listened and he said well ultimately you know you have to reduce yeah, it has to come down to a you have to make these assessments on probabilities or you know all by all available Why? evidence he argued that by all available evidence you know you can't know for absolute certain that there aren't sentient clouds of gas that you're going to sort of trample on in your life generating kind of drive to turn the whole universe into a thriving like space yeah. nature reserve which is kind of his idea was just like every planet out there I think, I, don't, I hope I'm not misrepresenting Eric, I mean it's a you know, really interesting viewpoint. But so there's a dead planet out there, it's kind of our duty to turn it into this lush, kind of thriving planetary nature. The living stuff reserve. turns into dead stuff. Yeah. And in a way that from some perspectives could be seen as quite unpleasant as well. Like, it could be seen as like, doing something, you know, going around 
creating causing suffering. All this suffering. Yeah, all so leave it alone. Let it. Yeah. Well, when when I went, I, I went on one of these ten day vipassana med meditation retreats, and I remember getting quite troubled a few days in after the teachings seemed to be saying that, as far as I could understand, with my you know not very well informed mind, um, that the aim of what we were doing was to try and. Uh, basically recognize realize that the that, that our seeming self didn't really exist and sort of kind of switch off our own consciousness get off basically stop reincarnating on the wheel of karma stop incarnating it as as a sentient being in 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 a in the universe mm. uh and basically switch that thing off and that we're trying to not just do that but also encourage it you know sort of become a body bodhisattva to sort yeah. of help everyone else get off the boat first before we did so the, the phrase, you know, with the last sentient being in the universe, switch out the lights before they cease to exist, yeah. or something like that came into my mind. And I remember thinking, so what we're trying to do here is extinguish all life in the universe. Is this what Buddhism is supposed to be about? And I remember getting quite confused. And but this is what my dad says as well. He thinks Buddhism is a death cult. Buddhism is a death cult because it's trying to do that. It's yeah. trying to extinguish consciousness in and the that, universe. That is the basic teaching, though. Life is suffering, and you want to like re try and reduce the amount of suffering as much as possible. And you could do that by just killing everyone. And I think there was... But you can't if people are being reincarnated, so you have to go about it more carefully. Oh, I see. Them. Yeah, you have to teach them how to stop, get off the wheel. and. But then when everybody does, it's like, wow, great, you know, got this universe devoid of consciousness. Is that what you wanted? I remember just feeling really sort of conflicted in a way. Um, but I think... It, that was a crude misunderstanding, and with my slightly less crude understanding of Buddhist doctrine now, the idea is sentient beings cease incarnating because they are kind of reabsorbed into... There's only one consciousness, and it's mm. basically got confused and thinks it's all these different things, yeah. and it just returns to its... There is... there is, You can't... It's not that... Well, and also, the, the universe as we know it is... Like you were saying, there's only sentient beings. This is almost where we started. You said there's only sentient yeah. beings and their experience and this idea of there being this material universe that hosts the sentient beings is probably a complete misunderstanding. And in fact, there's a set of sentient beings having a kind of collective dream of this thing called the universe that yeah. they're incarnated in. And the idea is to kind of stop the dream, not switch off the sentient beings. Or like the, yeah, the, the whole the whole thing is like one unified consciousness and it can do this thing where it like fragments into little ones and that's kind of cool and so it does that for a while but eventually it's like well that was my time of youthful folly and one by one all the consciousnesses all the fragmented ones drift back into the whole one and it's just uh, you know very wise and serene reintegrated into this wide, serene, unified yeah. consciousness that then that we can't possibly understand or imagine because we, we're just so removed from that. But I think we can a tiny bit. Yeah, I think it can occasionally like <laughs> present itself to us and it's always ineffable, isn't it? It's always sort of beyond language, but so... Although you went at Rob Dickens' talk, no? Yeah, I was, yeah. yeah. He said, people only say it's ineffable if they've been reading William James. Ah, oh, just as I said the word ineffable, I thought, there's a trap here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um... I yeah. was quite interested by that, because I tend to just think yeah, it's ineffable, <clears throat> then I was thinking, no, I suppose you can describe things at great length, but <laughs> ultimately everything is ineffable now, and some things are ultimately more ineffable than other things as well. It's not effable, can't be effed. I wonder what that word's about. But yeah, we went to a talk about um, psychedelic poetry by Rob Higgins. He's doing a Dickens. Yeah. Dickens. Yeah, what was it? I, <laughs> there's a Rob Higgs that I got mixed. So that was a strange event. I thought uh, yeah, we needed to swap numbers. This. Yeah, and I had a Rob Higgs in my phone, and I'd always thought it was him. And it turned out to be someone who'd lived next to him in a boatyard in Falmouth. <laughs> but but there was no real reason why they should have ever met each other. Um, but yeah, Rob Dickens, sorry Rob, Psy Psychedelic Press, uh, he publishes this, this journal and studies psychedelic poetry. And, and the history of writing mediumship. Really? That's what his PhD is about. Ah, oh, I didn't know it's that. Really good. History of writing mediumship. Yeah, threshold writing, right. luminography, you know about this. Uh, well, tell me more. <laughs> 
And just well, uh, I'm sure we've talked about it before. It's automatic writing. Yeah, I've heard about automatic writing. The automatic writing is not a very good word for it. A lot of people think because a lot of branches of of uh, people doing where the better word is threshold writing um, consider it as being channeled. So t for it to be automatic. Like suggest that it comes from you. Yeah, I see. Yeah, You're opening kind of yourself up else. to let something else write through you. Yeah. Yeah, and um, liminography or luminography. Liminography. Liminography. Threshold right. writing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which I think threshold writings is a really good name for a collection of poems. Mm. I got right. At. But um, so there's this experiment he told me about. Well, it's not an experiment. It's like a form of therapy. Um, where um, you hold a book in one hand and read aloud from it and the therapist stands behind you and set, asks you questions outside of the range of hearing and you're like supposed to be doodling on a sheet of paper and like write if you seem to want to write but because you're reading aloud you can't focus on Oh, it writing. switches off that part of your mind that's mm. controlling the conscious yeah. choice of what you're writing right um, and so then when they ask you questions supposedly it's been quite successful many times people like answer the questions and as well there's like a strange thing where often like multiple personalities seem to come through like really distinct personalities answering different questions right um, so William James kind of conditioned us all to think that experiences of some sort of higher greater consciousness had to be ineffable and I, I'm just I, I'm struggling to think what that even means now just that it can't be contained can't be described can't yeah be you can't like communicate it adequately to another person right yeah and that's just maybe that's just giving up maybe we need to try <laughs> harder so youthful folly across the board now from drunk students to star evolution to universes podding off and sentient beings, sentient beings incarnating and eventually disincarnating, having done their youthful folly thing. So we're going to start seeing this in everything now. All processes, you see this gushing mountain stream just starting to, doesn't know where it's going. And eventually it just entropies. Supposedly, but I think that's, um, People will look back on this entropic uh, pessimism and laugh, like my friend Steph laughed when I told him about it, because he's, he thinks in terms of mythology and poetry, I suppose, and we just got talking about science, and I had to scratch my head and really think, what, what, is, what does science tell us? Like, what's, what's this all for? Where's it all going? What's, what's it got to tell us? As opposed to a you know, religious narrative or something where you know, we're, we're on a mission to build heaven on earth or reunite with the Godhead or whatever it is we're told we're supposed to do. And the reductionist materialist science thing is just like, oh yeah, well, it doesn't really matter because it's all going to turn into an entropic heat bath anyway. <laughs> but there's, yeah, there's all these competing worldviews that are starting to emerge to do with, well, things like emergence and self-organisation and um, the kind of biocosm the idea of the aspects of the universe being sentient or, or attempting to generate sentience as part of some process we don't fully understand. And all of these ideas are slightly fringe, slightly wacky.